Wow, that was great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I, I'm just kind of blown away. Thank you, Alex. Um, welcome to Green Lake. And um, I just want to uh, say happy Sabbath to you. I am blown away by the music. I am blown away by the talent in here. And um, I'm just so happy to be alive here um, at Green Lake Church. Uh, I want to bring your attention to the announcements here. And I think we have another announcement that uh, would like some special attention. Do we have another one? Uh, would you like to come forward? Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. That was very slick. I was running around in the hall and was late getting here, and you didn't. Thank you. Great cover. <laughs> wow. A blowing day, huh? And you, got, but you guys all made it. Way cool. Delighted you're here. This is the first Sabbath of the new orchestra season, right? So an enormous thank you to all of you. And choir, you did not let wind and storm and threat keep you away. Thank you for being here this morning. Thank you, Wanda. Yeah. And even you folks, you managed to get here. Thank you for being here. We have a number of announcements to share with you this morning. If you want to look at the announcement page, we'll start there. This afternoon, we have another baby shower. I think we've been averaging one a week. <laughs> this is wonderful. You know, it's mushroom season and babies are popping up. <laughs> so we have a baby shower uh, today uh, for Tavita and Taj. And uh, they are expecting a boy at the end of October. That's pretty exciting. Thank you, Brian. Yes. Um, I'm going to make one more announcement and then grab a mic. Um, Billy Wood died, um, I believe, last, I think it was Thursday when I was on the plane last week. Uh, she, that is the sister of Myrtle and Amanda and Hattie. Uh, she had been sick for a long time. Um, and so we extend our condolence to the family. The memorial service or our funeral will be held uh, this coming Thursday, October 20, uh, at the Evergreen Washelle Funeral Home. So I um, want to remember that family in their loss. Brian, come and talk to us about Pumpkin Farm. All right. Yeah. That we, we're, 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 I'm going to order some sunshine for you. All right, thank okay. you. <laughs> no, we I... like the rain. This is Northwest. We embrace it, right? That's what we do. <laughs> so it is raining this weekend, of course, it's the Northwest. And we are planning to go to the pumpkin patch, rain or shine, tomorrow. Uh, we don't need electricity to enjoy the farm. So the tractors still will be running without electricity. And the corn maze, will, the corn will still be there, pumpkins will still be there. So if you open up your bulletins to the back inside, uh, the very bottom you'll see pumpkin farm visit. So the young families from Beginner, Sabbath school, kinder, and primary, we're all going to the pumpkin patch. We're not, maybe not all going, but I'm planning to be there, and we're going to go rain or shine. And if you'd like to come join us, even if you don't have kids, you're welcome to join us. 10.30 tomorrow morning, well before the Seahawks game, so in, in case that matters to any of you. And um, hope to have fun. Make sure you bring a rain jacket and boots. All right. Hope to see you there. Grandparents are invited, I gather, yeah, huh? Yeah. Yeah. So no, if you... Look, I'm not young at heart. I'm old. But being a granddad, but being a granddad is just really cool. Yeah. So. I still love to have you. <laughs> and speaking of children, we have a baby dedication in our service today. Um, Anne Cyberlick. Let's see, I forgot Anne's middle name. Anne Hayden Cyberlick will be dedicated today. Uh, Ken Parker will be leading that part of our service. He's the pastor at the Enumclaw Church. He is also the grandfather of Anne. Um, so we're delighted that you're here, Ken and Brenda. And let's see, I, I have my cheat sheet so I can welcome the rest of you. Let's see, Julianne, I think I remembered your name. And if I can say your husband's name right, Wacross or something close to that, I think. <laughs> 
And uh, let's see, Lynn and Mark, delighted you folks are here. And uh, Ken, thank you for being here to, to do this special uh, service for baby Ann. Really appreciate that. Now I want to invite you to stand, greet one another, pass God's peace here in God's house. I'll invite you to find your seats. Let's open our hearts as the choir calls us into worship.
Let's pray. Almighty God, thank you for calling us into your presence this morning. Thank you for receiving us with a smile. Lord of the cosmos, even amid the chaos of this world, the tumult, we pray that you will work to bring forth justice and peace and the final establishment of your kingdom. Lord of our hearts, we pray that in this service you will shape us, you will mold us, equip us, that in the week to come, we may act as your agents to bring hope and help and healing. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. <clears throat> Good morning, church. Um, it's time for offering. Thank you. Um, today's offering is for the church budget. So I want to encourage all of us, out of love as a response to God's love and blessings to us, we need to give kindly and generously to support the ministry of the church. May the deacons please stand. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, as we gather here. As much as you have blessed us, help us, Father, to return to you in order to support the ministries. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Thank you for that wonderful music. I just may have to come to Green Lake once in a while just to enjoy the music, let alone to hear my colleague preach. We're glad that you're here today to participate in this child dedication. Um, certainly a joyful event. I've had the privilege of dedicating both of my other grandchildren, so this is my third opportunity. You know, at uh, both of my daughter's weddings, they said, you, you're dad. You're not the preacher at our wedding. But they've invited me to dedicate their children. Um, the last time I was in this church, John, was for Kimberly, my oldest daughter's wedding, was, was married here. So it brings back uh, some good memories. I'd like to start by reading in John, excuse me, in Mark chapter 10. And in the house, the disciples began questioning him about this again. So the disciples and Jesus are busy. They're in conversation. And in the middle of this, they were bringing children to him so that he might touch them, bless them, and the disciples rebuked him. They rebuked the little children. How dare you interrupt? Apparently, they're like some of us who grew up in the generation of children are to be seen. What's the rest of it? But not heard. They didn't like the little children interrupting. But you know, every time you hear a little baby cry in church, you should praise the Lord. Because that little child is the future of the church. And be thankful that the church will go on throughout other generations. Well, Jesus scolded the disciples for their attitude. In fact, in the New American Standard Version, it says he was indignant. He was not happy. And he said, permit the children to come to me. Do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it at all. When children are little, mom and dad are kind of like God to them. It's their place of safety. It's their place of comfort. And at times, even their place of discipline. But they see mom and dad as bigger than life. I believe, Whitney and Christina, that God has one main plan for Anna. And that is for her to have eternal life. For her to be saved from this old world of sin. And through the journey, there'll be tears. There'll be laughter. There'll be sacrifice. There will be some detours along the way. Enjoy the moments of laughter and the moments of joy. As Anna says her first words, takes her first steps, says her first prayer, sings her first song, and the list goes on and on. In presenting Anna to the Lord, you are publicly affirming your personal faith and trust in Jesus Christ. You're committing yourselves to pray daily for the physical, mental, social, and spiritual welfare of Anna, setting an example as you honor the Lord's day and as Anna learns to worship, to learn Christian songs, and to interact with the church family as a whole. You have a responsibility, Whitney, as the priest of the home. And Christina is Anne's, Anna's mommy. To role model for her 
what a Christian lifestyle looks like as you teach her and mold her in the ways of God. Looking for that teachable moment. And at times, the teachable moment shows up in sometimes the most funny and awkward ways. But they are there. Watch for them. The education and training of Anna is the highest service that parents can render to God. Some people think they need to go on a mission trip someplace to a third world country or something like that. And those are all good things and they're all important. But your primary mission is in raising Anna to love Jesus. Do not neglect the sacred trust that Jesus has given you. I want to invite Whitney and Christina, and little Anna, to come up at this time if they would. Today, I know it's your intention to present Anna Hayden to the Lord and to pledge yourselves to bring her up in the admonition of God. Today, we're going to ask God's blessing on Anna to put a hedge around her, to protect her from all the problems and struggles of the world, to give her good health. And you pledge to give her the very best benefit of a Christian home, a Christian church, and the very best Christian education you can find. Today, you accept the responsibility of maintaining your relationship, not only with each other, but with Anna, one of love, one of forgiveness, one of grace, and yes, again, at times, one of discipline. As we pray a dedication prayer today, I don't want you, the rest of your family, as well as the congregation, that you all have a part to play to. For we invite you to pledge yourself to be a support to Whitney and Christina and Anna. There may be moments she spills her juice at potluck or maybe decides that she's going to accompany Pastor John in his sermon. There may be moments that you just say, Lord, be Whitney and Christina right now. Because Whitney, she'll be a typical little girl. But praise the Lord for that. And her mom and I, and I know your parents are already in love with her. And God is in love with her too. So because you have a part to play, as Whitney and Christina and Anna and I kneel here as we dedicate her, if you would like to kneel with us, I certainly invite you to do so, as you pledge yourselves to be part of the life of this wonderful little girl. Dear Lord, you've invited the little children to come to you. You've blessed them. You protect them. And so we bring Anna to you today to dedicate her to a life that is Christ-centered, to a Christian lifestyle. And Lord, may the day come when we'll all be in heaven together for there is no more pain or sorrow or sickness or frustration or anything else that is bad. Christina and Whitney dedicate themselves just now. For you know the importance of mommy and daddy. And as a church family, may each one dedicate themselves, not only their own lives to you, 
but in their support and prayers for this young family. May the day come as Anna grows up and she becomes of age to make a decision for herself that she will choose Jesus as her personal savior. For that is the only answer to the problems in this old world. So we dedicate her to you today as we dedicate our own lives. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. If, if, if this was at my church, I'll typically invite the parents to go sit down and I'll just hold the little baby. Good morning, children. Happy Sabbath. Oh, what happened? I'll try it one more time. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. I have a question for you. Do you have rules in your house? Are there rules in your house? Can you tell me what some... No shouting. Oh, okay. What are some other rules in your house? What's the rule? No shoes upstairs. Oh, no shoes on the carpet. Do your homework before anything else. Oh, those are good rules. Do you like those rules? No. Okay. Do you do you, not hitting or pushing? Oh, okay. Oh, that's okay. We'll, we'll talk some more about that classmate later. Okay. Well, I know, Victoria, did, did you want to talk, us, talk to us about a rule in your house? Yeah. What's a rule in your house? Don't climb on the oh, don't climb on the window. I think that's a pretty good rule. We'll talk some more. Okay. Later. I know there's lots of rules. Now, I know, do you have rules like... Um, we go to bed at a certain time, yeah? And do you have rules like brush your teeth before you go to bed? So some of you already said you don't, oh, you don't have those rules. Okay, well, I know we have rules in our house too, and sometimes I don't like these rules, just like you. But why do you think your parents made these rules in your house? Because they don't like, oh, I, why do you think, to be safe, I, I, yes, I think that, I agree with that. And I know you know that, you know, they created these rules because they really love you and they want what's best for you. Now, I'm going to tell you two, stories, two short stories about a girl who followed the rules and two kids who, oh, no, a girl who didn't follow the rules and then two, another story about two kids who followed the rules. Which one do you think ends wet better? 
Hmm. So this summer, Eric and I went paddle boarding. Do you know what paddle boarding looks like? You stand on a paddle board, it looks like a surfboard, and then you paddle, you use the paddle, and you, yeah, you know those, okay, good. Well, anyway, so Eric is very careful with his things, and he likes his things neat and tidy. So one of the rules when we go paddle boarding is we have to be very careful where we put the paddle boards on the land. So when we went paddle boarding this summer, he said, watch out where you put those paddle boards because, you know, there's a lot of ducks here in this lake. You don't want to just put them anywhere. So I said, okay, okay. But really, I wasn't really I just wanted to get on the water, so I was rushing and impatient. So I just put the paddle board on the grass without looking. And guess what happened? We found out soon enough, oh, I had put the paddle board and the bags on some piece of grass that had, what do you think? Duck poop. Duck poop. Ooh, and you know what happened? We had to do the cleanup later, and that was not nice. It took a long time, and it took us a long, lot longer time to get on the water because I was very careful, careless, and I didn't follow the rules. Hmm, that's not very nice. I didn't follow the rules. You pointed it out? Yes. <laughs> okay. And then, so the next part of the story is when we finally got on the water, that's the second part of the story. So we had that day, we had Sophia and Isaac with us that day on the lake. And we told them there were a couple of rules if they wanted to go on the paddle board with us. First rule was they have to listen to us at all times. If we said stay on the paddle board, they had to stay on the paddle board. If we said keep your feet in the paddle, on the paddle board, they had to do that. And they had to listen. And then the second rule was that they just have to be very patient about, about these things. So after all, and it was a very nice day. It was sunny. The water was warm. And I could tell that Isaac especially really wanted to get his feet in the water. Do you remember Isaac? And uh, Sophia too. Well, after a really long time paddling, we finally got to the part of the lake that was really nice. And we said, okay, now you can put your feet in the water and you can put your hands in the water. And guess what they did? Can you remember what you did? They started splashing, splashing water everywhere and on each other. And they had such a good time. And we had no accidents because they listened to their rules. So, so you know, we... Right. Oh, yeah. Sophia's reminding me. It was very good because they, that they listened to us because that several times a canoe bumped into our paddleboard, but because they were holding on to the paddleboard, they didn't fall in the water. So. Yeah, and if we fall in Yeah, but that didn't happen. You didn't go to the bottom of the lake because you listened to the rules. So. Well, thank you, everybody. And, and, you know, also, before I forget, that is why we, God gave us rules, because he loves us. Now, in your buckets, there are wiki sticks for you to play with. So collect your bucket.
Father God who art in heaven, we thank you, dear Lord, for gathering us, Lord, from our places, O oh Lord, of comfort, and bringing us here, dear Lord, to worship you and to receive blessings from you. Father, we pray, Lord, that you bestow your enduring love, O oh Father, and your healing power, your protection on the following, Diane, Julie, and Tether. We also, Father, pray that you be with the Wood Sisters, O oh Father, for the loss of Billy. As we mourn as a congregation, Father, we pray, Lord, that you bless Amanda, Harry, and Myrtle. Be with Billy's family or children and grandchildren or father left behind. As a church, oh father, help us, father, to mourn with them, to love them, oh father, and comfort them. Prepare us, O oh Lord, as you speak to us. Help us, O oh father, to understand the purpose for which, Lord, you call each one of us, O oh father, to continue our life in this world. Help us, O oh father, to minister to our neighbors, and also be able to see you in our neighbors as you speak to us. Father, give us your love. Prepare us, O oh Lord, for the message. Bless the speaker this morning as he speaks to us, O oh Father, reminding us about love and help us, Father, to respond in kind. Father, we are reminded of Job in the Bible. This is our moment. Help us to find our place in amid this conflict, O oh Father, that continues between good and, and bad. Help us to stand for you always. Bless us all. And we remember, O oh Father, those who are also sick and have not expressed or pronounced, O oh Father, requested prayer. We pray for them, dear Lord. There are those in our midst and those, O oh Father, who are at home. We pray, Lord, that you continue blessing them and giving them peace. Thank you, Father, for listening and, 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 and understanding and in giving us your love and blessing continually. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Testament, Deuteronomy 10, 17 through 11, 1. For the Lord your God is the God of gods and the Lord of lords. He is a great God, the mighty and awesome God, who shows no partiality and cannot be bribed. He ensures that orphans and widows receive justice. He shows love to the foreigners living among you, and he gives them food and clothing. So you too must show love to foreigners, for yourselves were once foreigners in the land of Egypt. You must fear the Lord your God and worship him and cling to him. Your oaths must be in his name alone. He alone is your God, the only one who is worthy of your praise, the one who has done these mighty miracles that you have seen with your own eyes. When your ancestors went down into Egypt, there were only 70 of them. But now the Lord your God has made you as numerous as the stars in the sky. You must love the Lord your God and always obey his requirements, decrees, regulations, and commands.
The New Testament reading comes from Matthew 22, verses 34 through 40. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees with his reply, they met together to question him again. One of them, an expert in religious law, tried to trap him with this question. Teacher, what is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of the word. Yesterday afternoon, about 4 o'clock, I hopped in my car, put the dog in the back, and drove 3 or 4 miles to a little tiny park called Mount Peak. It's a little tiny mountain. The park is just lines drawn around this mountain, and people go there to go up and down the mountain. Usually there's a 
dozen, sometimes 20 cars parked there. But you might remember yesterday afternoon was not prime outdoor weather. And uh, so when I pulled in, there was only one car. Rexy and I got out and we started up the hill. It was Friday afternoon. I was just taking the kinks out. The trail is really steep. So I went easy. We just kind of trotted up the hill. And as we got higher into the big trees, the wind began to, to make an, a, a roaring symphony overhead. I did think about branches falling down, but they didn't. No trees fell while I was there. It was glorious. In the lower areas, it's been logged, and the trees are a haphazard, nondescript regrowth. But as you get higher, somebody at some point didn't cut. And you have these incredible dug firs and western red cedars. Yesterday, the biggest one I stopped by was more than four feet wide at head height. And the reason I know is because I can't help myself. I kind of have a tree lover. And when you go among really monster trees, you got to talk. And so I usually, at some point on my run, I will stop and converse with the tree. And since they don't speak English, I put my head against the tree and I put my arms out and just, just kind of hang with the tree for a minute to kind of to try to feel the immensity, the grandeur of this, this tree. This is really simply psychotherapy for me. It's not exercise. To go and just move my legs and fill my lungs and converse with the trees. Yeah, feels good. And late in the run, I finally go, yeah, that's, that's what I've been trying. All week long, I've been working on the sermon. My sermon was... Two words. And I kept thinking, I need more than two words. But the two words came together. I said, yeah, that's, that's what I've been feeling all week, but couldn't, couldn't grab the words for. I love that place. And I love running there. And I love running on sunny days. And I love running, I can't believe I'm saying this. Those of you who know me, I'm not a native Northwesterner. I'm a desert rat. I love running on rainy days. I've run there in the snow. I love that place. And it always restores my soul. I know this so well that after you know, many years of running on that mountain, I actually don't have a hard time going there in bad weather because I, I know so deeply I'm going to love it. <laughs> I imagine somebody talking to me 18 years ago when I first moved here and I'm still cursing the clouds every day and they said, what you really need to do is go run in that rain. Yeah, you should do that. And I'd be going, you're an idiot. Oh, wait a minute. I said we're not supposed to use that word. Um, I would repent of my words, but not the thought. <laughs> what do you mean? I ate it. And now you're saying the answer is to go out in it. You're crazy. Except that at least for me, that's the truth. I remember early in my time here in the Northwest as I'm wrestling with the, the weather, one of my friends said, John, the only way you'll make it is you have to go out. If you stay in, it'll, it, it will crush you. You gotta go out. And Friday as I was running in the storm, loving every minute of it, 
I'm going, yeah, George was right. I've been doing a series this fall on the Ten Commandments. Now we kind of leave the Ten Commandments behind and we go to the, the number one commandment. Love God. The greatest commandment is love God. And I lived with this all week. I'm going, so that's the commandment. You know, here's what you have to do. Love God. Do any of you hate Brussels sprouts? Okay, imagine the commandment says, you have to love Brussels sprouts. And you go, I hate Brussels sprouts. And some big guy says, no, 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 you have to love them. He goes, I hate them. And then he gets your arm behind your back and says, say, I love them. Say, I love them. I hate them. And finally, the pain gets so great, you go, okay, I love them, I love them. He lets your arm go, and you go, I hate them. Right? I mean, nobody can make you like Brussels sprouts, right? It is crazy to tell somebody, you have to love it. I don't care what it is. You have to love it. That's a, that's a nonsensical statement. And if we understand the words of this command, whether we're quoting them from Jesus or quoting them from Moses, it wouldn't matter. If the way we understand this command, this, this language is, this is God getting his finger in your face and going, you have to love me, then God is not any different from any other abusive monster. So how do we make sense of these words? If you love someone, you desire them, you admire them. Twenty-five, maybe thirty years ago, I fell in love with the world expert on wasps. His name is Terry Griswold. I was a speaker at a camp meeting in Utah, and he was playing the piano in the junior tent. Some of you will have the picture. This is a weekend convocation. Maybe it was all week long. Anyway, this, this big thing. And he's playing for the kids, and we got to talking. Theology and everything else. I mean, and it was like the first time we talked. We must have talked for an hour. And then every day, you know, we, every time we could escape our other dudes, we talked. And we stayed in touch over the years. His kids, my kids. He's Uncle Terry, even though they hardly know him because they've heard me talk about him. He's just a cool guy. And if you met him, you know what? You'd love him too. In fact, everybody that I know that loves I meet people. Because he's a scientist, an Adventist scientist, and that's a fairly small world. I can run into some Adventist scientist in Florida and go, hey, do you know Terry Griswold? They go, Terry? Oh, man, yeah, he's the coolest guy. I stayed at his house when we were studying something up there. He's magic. All you got to do is meet him, and you will admire him. You will like him. And if you want to talk all kinds of crazy stuff, you will desire to spend time with him. My kids and I, we will take 100-mile detours to go and have lunch with Uncle Terry. It seems to me the best way to understand this language. The first and greatest commandment is to love God. This is not God or some prophet pointing the finger and saying, you have to. It is saying, if you're smart, if you want to order your life in a way that actually aligns with the flow of the universe, you'll love him. In fact, all it takes is to see him, and you will admire him. And your admiration will lead to desire and ultimately, what do we do in love? We serve. And we will be 
happy to do it. What does it mean to be wise or to act wisely? It seems to me one definition is a wise act is one that after you did it, you're still glad you did it. You know, on Thanksgiving, sometimes wisdom is to not eat something, you know, that next plate of food. If you eat it, you will be happy at the moment that you're eating it because it tastes so good, and then later you're going, oh, what was I thinking? Wisdom is, that's really going to taste good, but I'm going to regret it, so I won't. And then an hour later, your stomach is happy, and you're happy, and the universe is better. Wisdom means behaving, acting in a way that you're still glad you did it after you did it. When we love God, we're glad we did. And then later, we're still glad we did. I'm intrigued with the language that we heard in our New Testament reading here. Jesus has been in debates with theologians. First, liberal theologians, Sadducees, then conservative theologians, Pharisees. And in both groups, a lot of the conversation that you hear has to do with authority. The Pharisees were trying to, you know, they made more and more and more rules and tried to, you know, and it was, this is the rule. It's, it's the, the heavy hand of religious authority trying to squeeze people into a smaller and tighter box all the time. The Sadducees responded by imagining that religion consisted of contradicting authority, so they tried to break off a few of these rules, open up the box. Then they come to Jesus and they say, so what's the answer? And Jesus says, it has nothing to do with authority. You cannot command love. And you can't forbid it either. It goes to a different place. The most exalted spirituality is rooted in love, and love is rooted in paying attention to that which is most admirable and desirable. And we believe that God is that. Yeah, I can't stop. <laughs> We need to apply this. Right now in the Adventist church, big arguments about authority, which means we're arguing about the wrong thing. If somebody says up, stands up and says, I'm the authority, if you allow that to define you, you've been hoodwinked, and it can define you either way. True religion is not the contradiction of that or obedience to that. It's kind of let the authority do whatever. We are called to love. And when we love, our life is enriched and the lives of those around us is enriched. In secular society, there's a lot of heated rhetoric right now focused on authority. Who has the authority? Especially personal authority. Beware. It takes us away from the fullest, richest humanity if our lives are ordered by authority. Authority is a stopgap measure. The highest command and therefore the greatest wisdom is love. Period.
Let's pray. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen.